Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this special live streaming episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And you know, Wes, it's been a minute <clears throat> since we've done a live stream like this because I don't know about you, but I've been working a little bit <laughs> just in the little. last couple, few months. I've been working just a little and 2020, I think we're all glad to say goodbye to 2020. You look good but, though, John. You look like you've survived the storm and weathered 2020. I have to say it. I have to say it. Hindsight's 2020. <laughs> oh, hey. We all knew that was coming. We all knew that was coming. I mean, that's horrible. That's just horrible. But hey, I mean, listen, you know, it I, is true. I mean, 2020 was a rough year for hmm. everybody. And we all worked in a way we really didn't expect we'd ever have to work. You know, it was kind of like hmm. full stop and then full go. Yeah. And so here we are back. 2021 is here. We've got this new year going. And all of a sudden, it sounds like all these things change. You know, we talk so much about it. What? It's almost been a year, Wes. It's hard to believe. Yeah, in two months, March, it'll be a year since we, well, two months, March 16th. Right? Yeah, March 16th. We were back a year ago, and we were first really getting a lot of series of craziness <clears throat> of live streams going where we were getting you guys informed about what was happening in the world of, you know, Congress and, you know, then the health side of things and COVID and we're talking about mm -hmm. stimulus bills and PPP and IDLE and all these words, all these acronyms that we had to all learn as dentists. And now here we are, 2021, and Congress decides to do something. So, Wes, I mean, I think this is the perfect time to bring back this ongoing song. What saga. an opportunity. What an opportunity to bring on two amazing people that take a look at these things for us so that we can do what we do best, which is turn a drill, seat a crown, propose treatment, and then behind the scenes, you've got people figuring it out. Well, look, we're going to bring you back to you. We're bringing back to you the people that really during COVID helped us mitigate and plan financially so that 2020 wouldn't be a bum or such a bum year financially for our practices. So without further ado, it's great to bring back on Justin Goodbread from financiallysimple.com. Uh, he's also a certified financial planner. And then also Chris Mahan from Mahan & Associates. Super excited to have him on because he's a master's in business administration. Also, he has an accounting firm, Pr Premier Practice Management Solutions. So I'm excited to kind of bring these two people to you guys to talk about PPP stimulus again. Is this yeah. even happening? Blast from the past, guys. And I, you know where I want to start with this because, guys, we're just so glad to have you back. It's been a while <laughs> Did you miss since this? we've had as much to talk about. <laughs> I mean, you guys have always, you guys have been working nonstop since this whole thing went on. But Wes and I, as a lot of dentists have been, we've just been fixing teeth. And we've been trying to manage our practice and dig out of this last crazy year and just get through the end of the year. Meanwhile, you guys have been doing the research. You guys have been doing the digging. I want to jump right in here to what happened since last time we talked about PPP and taxes and everybody said okay round one ppp was pretty nice at first but then there was this huge fear that it would be a huge tax bomb because it would be counted as income and not deductible but things change so chris i'm going to go to you to start with this tell us a little bit about if you got a ppp loan last year 
there's all been a lot of changes in the forgiveness and the streamlining of forgiveness with a stimulus bill. And tell us why the tax situation has changed over the last just few weeks. Sure. Hey, it's great to be back with you guys. Um, again, it's changed materially because we were planning throughout the whole year since the initial rollout of PPP through the CARES Act. Um, it was our understanding and Internal Revenue Services interpretation that even though the the PPP loan is is not taxable if you know forgiven, um, that the expenses paid for those monies would be non deductible. So it inherently reverse engineered made that a taxable distribution, um, and that got cleaned up um, through through the legislation that just passed with the Consolidated Appropriations Act that passed last week. Um, so that's huge because I mean we've been planning, I've been meeting with clients, and I've been taking that. You know, the average PPP loan is right at $100,000. So let's just use that for example, that hundred grand and dropping it to the bottom line for taxable income for all of our tax strategy uh, analysis and planning with our clients. So this really, the good news is those tax strategies that we incorporated based on that are only going to help put them in a better position for 2021 um, because we got fairly aggressive with certain things. M many clients did, or they, or they would have had to pay a lot of taxes. So it's just, it's a great thing that they got this cleared through and it's really going to make this that much more of an, uh, a, a help or an assistant to small businesses during this challenging time. Hmm. So when you talk about deductibility, what exactly does that mean for the average business? You know, what they're, they're going to see instead of that just being income, that's now going to be deductible as long as it was used for appropriate expenses. Is that, is that right? That's exactly correct. So, you know, say the hundred thousand dollars, let's say it was used on qualified expenses that you had to utilize to get it forgiven the payroll, the, the rent or mortgage interest, utilities, et cetera. Um, now, um, those expenses are deductible and basically you got free money. So you got the hundred grand, you don't pay any taxes. The other way that it was initially interpreted was you got the hundred grand, you paid your payroll and qualifying expenses. You didn't get to deduct those though. So now you and get to kind of double that was your big you fear back budget. to one of the last things we talked about was that you had well, both you guys really, but Justin, you brought it up in particularly that you really was concerned that we were going to get hit with some taxes on that money we take. And welcome back to the show, Justin, take it. Yeah, man, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, this is a 5,000 page bill, friends. I mean, Chris just kind of glosses over it saying, yes, it's the Consolidated Appropriations Act, but it's 5,000 pages long. What we dealt with in this particular, as Chris just mentioned, is that it's going to create deductibility. If you'll remember back even in April of last year, we were talking to listeners of the show. Chris and I were sitting here <laughs> waving a flag saying, if now more than ever, you've got to make sure you're talking with your planners because of the lack of deductibility. And so Chris hits it nail on the head right away that this is a big pickup but there's an addition for this year for as, as we go back in this new bill they actually add some additional things that are able to be deducted last year so maybe you're doing your calculation and you say okay we had this 60 percent payroll mortgage etc uh rent you know utilities but you still didn't meet it underneath this new rule there's four additional areas that you're able to deduct last year and with the new ppp which i know we're going to dive into but as we're talking about last year let's also be aware that we can deal with co um, various covered operating expenditures like business software cloud computing things of that nature we can also deal with damage Damage that was related from uh, vandalism or looting, things that happened out of public disturb disturbances that we saw last year. Their supplier costs that now can be brought back from 2000 and, uh, 2020. And there's other protection expenses that we deal with as relates to CDC, HS, HHS, or OSHA. So even though we're dealing with PPP present going forward, there's some rules inside this act that's also going to make the old PPP, if you've not claimed deductibility yet, it's going to bring actually a little bit more weight to it. Perhaps the biggest thing, I know, Chris, I know that you're looking forward to this more than ever, is that they're going to streamline those loans who were less than $150,000 in, in value as far as the PPP origination. Guys, I got to tell you, I already had my loan PPP forgiven and it was greater than $150,000 for our company. And it was a nightmare to try to get through mm. all that. In fact, I, I had to have a ton of time and energy. Well, now if you have less than $150,000, it's simplifying it out. We're going to get some guidance on that. And I know Chris's team, with the work they do over at Mayhem, they cannot wait to see this simplified process for what we've experienced this last quarter of 2020. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very careful about anything that Congress or SBA says is simplified. 
Because they said it's a one pager, but they haven't said how big the font has to be. Right? So, <laughs> I'm telling you, these, uh, these, these banks have so much, you know, just, I don't know, anxiety about it that it doesn't matter if the SBA says, oh, it's just this one sheet or the bank's underwriting are still, at least in my experience, making you go through a lot, a lot, a lot of hoops. Um, and again, I think that new um, streamlined form is supposed to be out January 26th because everybody's calling me saying, when should I do the PPP forgiveness? I'm like, hey, you need to wait because the banks don't know what to do just right yet. Okay, and, so and that's a good we'll, piece of info right there. January yeah. 26th would be the time that you should really expect to start getting like the final guidance on the forgiveness. So if you have a loan under 150, that's the kind of the target date that we're waiting for. Well, and John, I'd be careful with even final guidance. So go back in your mind's eye. We were in the Wild West, as we often said last time. How many times have the rules changed throughout? They just dropped a 5,000 page bill. The last one, guys, was only 600 pages. This is 5,000 mm. pages long. It's ridiculous. So I can yeah. just about bet that this thing's going to be morphing and changing just as much, if not more, than it was last time, because now they're looking backwards and forwards with these regulations. That, hmm. That's a great point. And it's 5,593 pages to be exact. <laughs> yes, I read it twice. I read it That's twice right. with a highlighter in my hand because I have no life. <laughs> we were here just a, right, a, lot of, a lot of the changes. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go. A lot no, of the go. changes that they made on this PPP really round three, but, you know, um, is that it goes retroactively back and, and, and it modifies opportunities with your original PPP funds. And as Justin, you know, so eloquently stated, there are additional expenses that qualify as PPP money now that you can utilize those for those funds as long as 60 percent of them are used for payroll. And so, again, you want to if you can and you have the, those other qualifying expenses, mortgage interest, rents, uh, software, cloud computing, drive through windows, air ventilation systems and those types of things that you utilize in 2020. You want to use as much of that money. The optimal deal here would be only to use 60 percent for payroll and have the other 40 percent allocated to the other, because in this new bill, they really modify the employee retention credit, which can be some serious chimichangas for people that if you don't have advisors that are looking at your payroll and how your payroll set up and, and payroll taxes are done and your accounting, then, then they probably won't have a clue to even go get this potential opportunity. This is the opportunity, right, that you speak about, right? Is like maximizing the ability to one, understand what is capable here, right? And you just hit on some things that I think for our listeners, if you're not, if you're doing your own payroll, I can't imagine, right, trying to navigate some of this stuff, right, um, unless you're super savvy, right? And so I, that's one of the reasons why that John and I over the years have relied on third parties to do some of these mundane tasks to make sure that and we're still involved in it, but it's not as much as just, hey, let's get the payroll in. Let's make sure things are right. But letting people that are qualified to handle these things. Now, you mentioned and one of the one of the questions that John and I have is that we're hearing about a lot of these tax bombs that are being dropped in from 2020. Like, for instance, there are possibly higher taxes for many doctors. What's going on right there? Well, there's possibly higher taxes, and I'll just share with you just for the fact that a lot of practices really focused, rebalanced, and reinvigorated their, their service line and their practice, and many practices did better than they did the prior year, even in a COVID year being shut down 20% of the year, right, or for two months. Um, so that's something that's come into play where you've seen really the entrepreneurial innovation of doctors coming through and saying, hey, man. I'm at home for two months. I've got to find a way to make a more efficient practice. Give you know, what services am I going to expand on? What revenue streams can I in increase? And what expenses can I can I you know make more efficient? I guess is a better word. So a lot of people came out of COVID and were forced to really reflect on their business. It's that Stephen Covey Q2. Right? Nobody has time for Q2 Quadrant Two, which is right. the long term planning, the 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 time you spend in investing in how you can generate more income in your business than just doing the, the, the technical components. And I think a lot of dentists took that time seriously and listened to podcasts like this and listened to Justin Goodbread and all his wise guidance and really streamlined their profitability models. <laughs> and I've got a lot of people that are in a different tax position and, and came out better for it and got free money. 
Mm-hmm. And there's some advisors out there saying, yeah, man, you know, this PPP round two, really round three, but PPP round two, you know, I got practices that did better. I'm like, the way the law reads, all right, you got to go with the way the law reads. And if you have a 25% or more reduction in your revenues on any calendar quarter, that is at least right now until further guidance come out. It doesn't say, oh, you were down by 25%, but for the year you were the same. It says any quarter. And I think most people could, there's a fighting chance that every practice on the planet had where it's down 25% in Q2. <clears throat> yeah. Mm. And so let's kind of dive into that. You know, before we do that, maybe one more question pertaining back to the original PPP stuff. We had these idle grants, right, that came through. And my understanding now, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the idle grant we expected would decrease the amount of forgiveness, but now that does not. Is that right? That you you get to still full forgiveness. Say you got a ten thousand dollar idle grant on a hundred thousand dollar PPP loan. We thought we were gonna have to take that off, but now you can still get the hundred thousand forgiven without uh, the idle grant being in, involved. Does that does that sound right, guys? That's correct. Let me speak to that a little bit, John, because I actually dealt with that firsthand. I did receive an idle grant for $10,000. And whenever my forgiveness was done on my PPP loan, remember, it was greater than 150. So I had a really a book to fill out to get it forgiven. It was forgiven fast. I mean, once all the paperwork was there, but what was left on my bank account was a $10,000 liability for PPP. And so according to the previous rules, I was going to have to pay that $10,000 back over a period of five years. And there was an amortization table that the bank was already working on to provide to me. With this particular passage of, the, of this new law, we actually now, for those of us who maybe have already applied for forgiveness and gotten forgiven on everything except for this idle money, we'll have a new form that comes out that we go back and reapply to have the idle money forgiven. If you've not applied for forgiveness yet from from round one and potentially round two, as Chris is mentioning, um, then now you're going to be able to ask for forgiveness and right away, they're going to forgive the the idle money. There's not gonna be some sort of a clawback provision. So that's a pretty nice pickup that we have um, as part of this particular legislation, John. Yeah, that's huge. And, and let's kind of go from there. You know, so we've already talked, so we've talked now about PPP from you know essentially last year. We kind of know where we're at. Loans under 150, you're getting a simplified process, which we can look forward to maybe later this month. Um, we know the idle grants are not going to be really involved in the forgiveness side, which is huge. We know that really helps our taxes. But the big elephant in the room is this this new bill. And what is this this PPP round two or round three, as you said, technically? What does that mean for us? Let's talk uh, maybe, Justin, if you want to start going through that uh, a little bit about you know my our, our first question, and Chris, you already kind of alluded to this, is who is eligible for this? And you said yeah. 25% down in any given quarter. So Justin, talk about eligibility, because I think the first question that everybody's going to have is, can I get to this? You know, is this actually something that's that's available to me? And then we'll talk a little bit about what it could look like as far as the amounts and, and forgiveness and deductibility and all that, and kind of what you guys think as far as that goes. Sure. So let's remember in the very first round that we had some $300, $400 billion of money sent back. And then Congress had to act again, which is what Chris was referring to as round two, to free up additional monies for additional PPP monies. It was never, the second round was never fully exhausted. You need to know that in this particular bill, there's $284 billion. 284 billion, not near as much as the first time that we had the uh, PPP or even the second round in place. So there's $284 billion. The idea being is that a lot of businesses, for example, my business is not gonna qualify for this particular round two. In the dental business, more than likely you will because of the way the calendar in effect works. So first thing you need to know is that there's not near as much money available as before. Second thing is in order to qualify, you have to have less than 300 employees. That's the overwhelming majority of dentists out there. And you have to be able to demonstrate at least a 25% reduction in gross collections, not production, gross collection or gross revenues or gross receipts in the comparable quarter to 2019. So to keep it simple, you may look from January 1st to March 31st of 2020 and compare that to the previous year. And if your total top line revenue is down greater than 25%, then then in and of itself, it will you'll qualify. As Chris mentioned, you can pick second quarter. One of the questions that I've already asked that Chris, maybe I'd love the insight on this, maybe you've heard this particular answer, is a qualifying quarter, as I would determine it, is any 90-day period of time. 
one of the things that I've even tried to find from the SBA, and maybe you've already maybe heard this, or hopefully this will be one of the guidance that comes out. Can we look at maybe February the 15th to April the 15th? Or does it have to go on a calendar quarter? The law doesn't state. I don't know if you heard anything on guidance on that one as of yet. If I had to guess, I would I would assume, but again, you're right, it's not clearly identified that it's going to be on calendar quarter. So they can tie back to 941s, the payroll tax returns. But that's okay. not, again, that's not been ironed out completely yet. Um, but yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, it was $134 billion in the initial legislation. And there was so many different, you know, scenarios. Everybody wanted to be first to market with their analysis. And there were so many changes up to the last minute. They put another 150 to get that 284 billion you spoke of. They got carve outs all over the place. You know, again, it's two and a half times your uh, your average monthly payroll expense, just like the last time. So basically, if you qualify, you can assume that you'll get the same check this time. Basically, in a nutshell, give or take. Okay, um, it give you a ballpark kind of land. Um, but you know, but they got they got stuff earmarked for first time PPP because there were businesses that just didn't have access or do it. They got thirty five billion sitting over there for people that didn't get PPP, and they also gave a clearance on if they weren't in business in two thousand and nineteen because that was a big hurdle that we had to walk through with a lot of de novo practices that we had set up on January fifth. You know, February if they were in business on the day after Valentine's Day, two thousand twenty, then they qualify for round one, which you have to have round one before you get round three, so to speak. Yeah, and Chris, the way I've read it so far in my conversations, if someone did not qualify or did not take round one, in fact, I had clients who took it and gave it back because they'd rather have the 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 employer retention credit in place. Now they just got to go back, and we've got to qualify in the same fashion as we qualified for round one. Now they just removed that date that that. In, that have being in, in business before January 2019. Is that the way you're reading it as well? That's correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the other, when we the, talk the other about- interesting thing, John, the other interesting thing here is this, they cleared it up right off the bat before we were trying to figure out how to stress. Remember, go back in your mind's eye. We got the money and now we had to spend it all with that 60% as Chris is alluding to within an eight week period of time. And then they extended it 24 weeks. Well, right now, right off the bat with this new one, you're going to have the ability to choose eight or 24 weeks right off the bat. They've already cleared that one up for us as well this time. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so again, to kind of summarize, we're talking about if you got the first PPP and you were down materially 25% in collections in a single quarter, then you can uh, get expect to get the same amount potentially that you got the first time and are we expecting or has this been i i just don't know the answer to this has this been clear that this is also going to be deductible the same way as what they did with this uh, last round of ppp it's okay. crystal that's clear huge. in the rules mm-hmm. okay yeah, that's huge so we can essentially already yeah we can essentially already account for this that this is uh, not going to add to our tax burden potentially based upon that um and what all do you expect is going to need to be submitted for this? Because of course the application process, I just got an email today from my bank saying uh, that they are looking at this. They already have an application, which they sent over. They don't know exactly the timeframe of when things are going to be. They said it's supposed to be opening this next week uh, for submission, but they don't know exactly when their stuff will be going through. But what all do you expect that we're going to have to provide to the bank, assuming that you applied last time to the same bank, are you gonna to have to go and provide all the same information again? Or are they just gonna to wanna to see like a profit and loss statement showing a difference between the two quarters from 2020 to 2021, or I'm sorry, 2019 to 2020? Chris, what they do you think? Want third, they want third party documentation of the revenue decline and and you know the 25% dip that you may or may not have incurred. Um, in addition to, you know, one of the things that people are really a stickler on is you get this loan, but it's clear in there. It says, but the loan must be necessary. So here's kind of an asterisk. So we can go out there. A lot of people will get funding. I'll recommend just like I did on idle money, open up an account, use your old PPP account. If it's at zero and just drop it in there and maybe mm-hmm. park it until an additional, you know, IFRs come out or guidance comes out because, I don't want people to get it and then spend it. And then they come back and say, man, you really didn't need it. I mean, they they have been notorious, notorious for after the fact modifications, right? You're only, you're, you're only held to this though. You're only held to the law as it is on the date of application for forgiveness or loan. So whatever the law Mm -hmm. is that day, 
So if you want to be you know, really on top of it, you get it, you utilize it, and then we go through it as expeditiously as possible and get the forgiveness applications in for this round of funding, which would be 24 weeks after the loan funding date. That's the covered period, so to speak. Okay. Now, in this, one, in this one, they are allowing you to take it earlier, right? You can take it at, is at the point where you exhaust all the funding for the qualified expenses. Okay. So if, if, if Wes Mullins and, and John Rogers come through and we get the applications in on Wednesday, the money's wired and, and you get a, a deposit next Friday, let's just say hypothetically that's the date, then, you know, we would want to be tracking. And as soon as you hit that point for, you know, absorbing all that money for the necessary expenses, rent, mortgage, interest, utilities, you know, air ventilation systems, you know, a lot of those things, I would potentially recommend looking at go ahead and get your applications in so they don't come back after the fact Mm -hmm. and come in and say, oh, man, here's the new (laughs) criteria. If you're, you know, 12 month trailing was not down by 20 percent, then you didn't need the loan kind of thing. So those are some of the variables or the bogeys that we'll be watching. We've got a question from one of the listeners uh, watching us right now. Appreciate those that have tuned in for us and um, are checking this uh, episode out. Justin asks, um, I opened a startup late December 2019. We were open uh, six days in 2019. I'm not sure if I will be eligible because I can't show a 2020 quarter decline from 2019. Where will I fall? That's a, that's a yeah, go ahead, Justin. You got that? <laughs> no, I don't have that one. That's in the gray area as far as I'm concerned at this particular point. There's some rules. And unless you, Chris, you've seen clarification on that one. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Um, basically, a new entity. Um, entity is not in business in 2019, but in business prior to February 15th, 2020. Um, is the will be available for new PPP funding. So yes, that person should get with the bank and make their application and it'll be two and a half times their average payroll. So that they had to be in business prior to February 15th, 2020. But so for this person that was in business in December and had problems getting the funding or uh, in business, you know, in January, uh, definitely it's, it's there for them to get the money now. Okay. Well, that's good to know. So basically then, Again, you're 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 just to go back again to kind of recap what you, I think you guys are saying. This next round, because there is some question about you know the necessity for this new round of funding uh, as to what the exact guidance is going to be for who gets that forgiven. Your guy, your guidance at this point is absolutely apply for the funding, but uh, be aware that you really want to get the forgiveness going as quickly as possible so that there's not some rule change, especially now that we, and I don't know, maybe speak to this, especially now that we have a change in control of Congress, uh, you know, that, that I wonder how that's going to weigh in on some of this final guidance. Do you think that's going to play a role or do you think that this is just that it's kind of unclear as to uh, who, who really uh, gets eligibility for the forgiveness? Justin, talk to that. Talk about that. Yeah, I, I'm going to say it. I don't think it's going to matter because if you read the rules several times inside there, it talks about it prohibits a future administration from making things ineligible. So, for example, in the very first PPP, um, churches and religious organizations could not participate. It was crystal clear. This time they can. And inside there, when you see these majors, you'll see in the text it says prohibits a future administration from making changes. And I think they put that Hmm. throughout the text, John, to prevent whatever was going to happen. Remember, they passed this in December. No one knew exactly what was going to transpire. The last thing we also want to deal with is is going up thinking that we were going to use a particular guidance and all of a sudden it goes away. So, you know, I can't speak to exactly what's going to happen in the future. My crystal ball is broken. But I can tell you, if you read the bit, the text of the bill several times, I'm talking dozens, dozens, dozens of times, it actually puts inside there, and I'm going to quote it, and it says exactly here, it says, prohibits a future administration from making them ineligible. And it says that consistently throughout the text. So, John, I, despite politics, I don't think it's going to happen. But I do think that the guidance from the SBA, the Treasury Department, will continue to morph as all these what ifs come about like we did last time. Gotcha. What are some other things from this stimulus bill 
that uh, dental practice owners need to be thinking about, Chris. Uh, is there anything else that jumps right out to you? Um, I know you mentioned something about <clears throat> this credit, this employee retention credit. Um, there's a lot there, it sounds like. And, you know, what are some other things from this? Uh, I'll start with you, Chris, that, that uh, practice owners need to be looking at. Sure. Um, one of the things are covered operation uh, expenditures. You know, we've talked about a couple of them, but business software or cloud computing. So if a practice was looking at a infrastructure change in terms of their software, this may be a time to do it. Human resources, uh, also accounting. So if anybody wants to pay me a lot of money, I will take it to help get them PPP. <laughs> you no know, forgiveness. I'm gladly take that money. Um, but That's one nice. of the biggest parts that I'm really dig digging into right now is the employee retention credit. Now, this was one of those things that came out, and again, Justin and I did a lot of modeling before when phase one was happening, because <laughs> we were discussing, you know, our masterminding going, man, maybe we leave the PPP money alone and just get this employee retention credit because it's, it's super healthy. And, you know, we ran through and I was like, you just can't give turn away free money and we'll just, most clients wouldn't get the employee retention credit because the, the language was, if you had a PPP loan, you could not get the employee retention credit, okay? And that was for 50% of the $10,000 paid to an employee, you would get back vis-a-vis -vis payroll tax credits. Um, and so but previously, if you got a PPP loan, you're out of the game. It also previously, you had to have a reduction of 50% of your revenue. So not many of our businesses had a 50% reduction in a quarter. Um, now they've changed it to that. If you did have a PPP loan, you still can get the employee retention credit and um, and so and also it's not 50 percent of reduced revenues it's 20 percent so if your revenues are 80 percent or less in the prior year quarter over quarter so if you did 100 grand in q2 2020 and you did, you did 140 grand in q2 2019 bam you're in the game um hmm. and so so that could be huge i mean that could be really yeah. really big and i've ran a modeling sample on one a client that received one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in ppp money and they got it on may 7th well this employee retention credit says from wages paid from uh, march 12th to december 31st they say you can't double dip so i can't get an employee retention credit for payroll that i paid with ppp money but if i go from march 12th with this said client until May 7th and see the payroll that they pay their employees and basically up to 10,000 of wages in that quarter, they get a 50% of that as a tax credit. This client right here is going to save $23,000 on payroll taxes just by knowing of this opportunity out there mm. that I think can be super, super strong. Well, Chris, wow. isn't, there two, I mean, isn't there two big keys here that I want to make sure we hammer down? The first one, as you alluded to earlier, and Chris and Wes kind of went off into his fairyland, as he often does. You said um, you said that we cannot use the same calculation for PPP. We can't use the same wages for PPP and including the ERE, the employee retention credit, which means that that's where that 60 percent. That's why you said, hey, let's go ahead and use as much of the 60 percent up for PPP as much as and no more than that. We don't want to use 90 percent of your wages for for your PPP forgiveness, because then that brings in the employer retention credit. Am, am I correct on that? That's 100%. That's like high level strategy right there. I had a client yep. that was gonna go fill out their own forgiveness application and their banker doesn't know about employee retention credits. The bank's got enough to know about, right? So the banker's just gonna say, give me your payroll journal for 24 months. And if it's as much as your PPP loan, then voila. And I'm like, hold up, swelled up, right? The more that money that we can reserve for non-payroll related things, increases the opportunity for this employee retention credit, right? And again, there still has to be a 20% reduction in revenues, which may happen in Q1 of 21 because everybody came out into 2020 and was crushing at Q1 and then COVID mm -hmm. hit, right? And right now, everybody in most practices I'm dealing with, you know, are having a lot of cancellations and a lot of, you know, static because of this COVID spike, right? Just people aren't coming into their appointments. So you watch that 20% and you see what you did last year and you'll see kind of what that target revenue is for you to get that that employee retention credit for 21 as well, because that not only opened it up for us to go get from last year, they also expanded it into Q1 and Q2 of 21. So there could be some serious, serious money on the table if you qualify, but you want to make sure you look at all the angles and play the game right. So I said a lot of stuff right there, but back to Justin's point, you want to get that mortgage into every single other ex qualifying expense you can for PPP <clears throat> funding forgiveness and use it at up to 40%. So you can save some money for those employee retention credits. Back, so back that's just huge. That's 
Yeah, yeah, Wes, because, go ahead. Because, you know, I digress a little bit here in my fairyland and let you guys <laughs> handle these situations so I that knew Justin can come over to my house and actually wish that he could run my backpack blower uh, <laughs> my leaves. Instead, he's working late. Right? So, yeah. Yes. You can come yeah. on over to my fairyland, Justin. <laughs> so, I also know, I also know that in Q, the Q1 or Q2 of this year, the employee retention credit actually increases from 50% to 70%. So, that means there's a $7,000 versus a $5,000 tax credit that's eligible in the Q1. But I don't think that went backwards. I think that's only this year, calendar year. Am I correct, that's Chris? That's correct. The 50 to 70, 70% is just 21 uh, and it's and it's up to seven thousand per employee. You got ten employees yeah. and you qualify. That's seventy thousand dollars, right? Wow. So so, it, it, so just to, it just to again recap, because I want to make sure like I'm I'm hearing this and I'm just want to kind of like reflect it back and make sure I'm understanding. The idea being here that when we first got this PPP funding, there was a different percentage that you were supposed to use for payroll, right? It started off a lot higher. And then it kind of went down and with this employee retention credit, you guys are saying you really want to maximize what you use PPP forgiveness or the money that you're, that you're accounting for it, it, to not be payroll related, potentially, if you see this dip, because then you can use that payroll that didn't get forgiven essentially to qualify for this employee retention credit. Am I understanding that kind of right? Is it that you, you really want to try to maximize other things than payroll when you do your forgiveness? Is that correct? That's correct. And, and also okay. back in the original language with the, the funding dates and your basically covered period or the 24 weeks, right? There was language in there that I'm going to verify and I'll huddle with you guys about, you know, and let you know, but your, your covered period or your funding date didn't start on the date that the loan dropped in your account. It was the next payroll period. So you might've got a, in your account on a Thursday and paid payroll on a Friday and that payroll, if you play the game right, that could be used for the employee retention credit, which could be some serious cash, right? Mm -hmm. You know, 50% of mm -hmm. what you paid out, I think 50% of that payroll paid back to you. So for example, if this this one client got funded on May, on May 7th, but their first payroll after May 7th was May 14th or May 15th, I'm gonna take all the payroll up until May 15th and go backwards for that employee retention credit. Gotcha. Gotcha. This sounds like this is a huge, this is a huge amount of money we're talking about with just this one thing. And I don't really get the feeling that many people are, are really understanding that very well. I think everybody's so focused on PPP that this kind of has gotten lost in the shuffle. So it really sounds like you need to be talking to your advisor about this and understanding this because this is not simple math. You've really got to think about even when you go through this forgiveness process for PPP from last year, let alone the second round, and you got to play your play your cards right because you can be talking about a huge difference in your tax burden. And and so, you know, I think that that this the biggest thing that I'm hearing is that that side of it, the employee retention credit. I mean, do you guys feel like that's the biggest arbitrage here, or the biggest thing we need to be thinking about? Is there anything else, Justin, that you would say from this uh, in the like kind of the last few minutes that we have here? Uh, anything else you would say? that people need to be looking at from the stimulus bill or other kind of planning they need to be doing uh, in this next uh, month or two. Yeah, one of the coolest things that I love is that we have 100% deduction on meals. And so if you go to a restaurant, if you do uh, carry out or delivery from a restaurant, um, it's 100% deductible current in 21 and 22. So currently it's 50% for 20. And what they've done is to try to stimulate the restaurant business to create more fun, more, um, uh, revenue for that business. So this is the year that if you want to have fun, go out to eat, uh, buy meals for your team, um, whatever your CPA, someone like Chris and his firm over there will, will agree with, this is the year to do it. This is the year to, to move into the restaurant business and, and support them. Um, there's a lot of planning though that's going to be able to be utilized throughout the year. So we can still go in and take distributions from our IRAs, 401ks, without the 10% penalty this year. Where that may come into play is, you know, not every one of the, not every business out there is like our practices that are rock stars and they've we had several businesses this year that had their top best year ever right i mean they're just rocking it out some people may have to you know take it on the chin 
That's a great year to do Roth conversions. That's a great year to start taking some money out, maybe go non-qualified even to create a, a spread within your overall um, planning number. So, John, we don't have time to go through 5,000 pages and all the different tax credits. I've got a list. You've seen three pages of it, of all the credits that I've even pulled out of it thus far. There's a lot of things here, and I'm going to say, like I said last year, this year, 2021, is shaping up to be the same, uh, hopefully not the same, but it's going to be the same area for Chris and I that we're going to have to stay on top of this and track it throughout the year all the political moves and this is the year to stay in touch with your planners and your advisors one last mm. question from a listener right now charles says i just opened a startup in december actually december 9th of 2020 and he was like i started the process of building the office in march of 2020 i'm assuming i won't qualify to my understanding that's correct um Bum. i don't believe i don't believe so unfortunately um, and then this is an asterisk again on this employee retention credit. I mean, that's on page 3,396. So we're still working <laughs> through the application of that. So it's not going to be ac applicable to all, but there is a ton of opportunity that we're currently researching right now. So I wanted to. This is that. great. You know, and I really appreciate your all's attitude, attitude towards this because it is some of the hardest things to navigate is some of these, these documents that come out of these, uh, these packages. I mean, it's, it's daunting. It would take me days to even get where you guys are even at. And I may not even get there. Probably not. Okay. So what I'm going to say is that we're so glad that you've joined us, Chris and Justin today to kind of shed some light on PPP. And as we close the show, I know both of you've got your own thing going as far as like podcasting and, and just try to draw awareness to what you can do to what we like to say, take it to the next level. So we'll start with Justin, then we'll close with Chris and then John, you can close out the show. Sure. So you can check out financiallysimple.com. That's our education portal. We give away 99.99% .99 of the information as we've done through here on the financially, I mean, on the dental guys show. We do have our webinar starting this year called the business reset challenge. I'm challenging every business owner, every business owner out there, dentists included to do a hard reset in your business and figure out what are you going to do from this point forward to capitalize on the opportunity that PP, that 2020 showed you. In your business, you know where your strengths are, you know where your weaknesses are, and if you're not, if you don't change, if you don't go create intentionality in your business from this point forward, you're just gonna revert back to the habit. So now is the time to reset your business. Focus on where you want to be, we'll figure out where you want to be, and then let's move on from there. So my challenge is to go to financiallysimple.com. You can check us out there. And if you want to learn more about the Business Reset Challenge, it's on that particular uh, website as well. Awesome. Um, one side note before I talk about our, you know, our services is also, guys, just a heads up, HHS stimulus. People that applied for HHS stimulus money, the portals open up on January 15th and are only open for 30 days for you to go online and enter your information to attest that you use that money for the right things or you may have to pay that back. So just anybody got HHS money, it wasn't a get it and forget it. There's another step to it. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that. And then, you know, if you go to mayhanassociates.com, no www there, Justin. So moving ahead of time, um, you'll see the, the comprehensive business services that we offer to our clients, um, you know, really synchronizing all of the aspects of their business from payroll to, to financials and, 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 and uh, practice uh, profitability optimization. Uh, we try to increase the top line revenues for clients, uh, maximize the profits. And then the most important key is the tax strategy where you can build more wealth in having a, a really good tax advisor than any other advisor on the planet because you can just save so much money uh, in taxes. So that's what we do. So give us a give, check us out. We have a practice power play podcast. Uh, just did one with Howard Ferran last week. So it's pretty cool. So give it a, give it a look. And uh, man, I sure appreciate it being able to mastermind with all of you guys. Well, this has been a great show. Um, I think that, you know, what you guys are all hearing <clears throat> is it's just kind of scratching the surface. I think you've gotten some good nuggets today to uh, get you thinking and uh, enough to, uh, to make it to where you have some guidance of what we're going to be thinking about over the next month or so. But I think if anything, every time we do these shows with Chris and Justin, I always come away from this thinking, well, you need people. You need good people because uh, to try to manage this all yourself is just not possible. And I think having someone that has dental background or dental knowledge, uh, this is where it really pays off because they understand the nature of our businesses. And 
you know, so we definitely are, are, are thankful for them to be here. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, if this was uh, beneficial to you, if it helped your practice, if it helped your business, uh, go ahead and, uh, and let us know that, you know, give us some good feedback, whether it's on Apple podcast, where we can you know, give us a five-star rating. It helps us a ton to get people aware of our podcast or whether it's uh, just giving us some good feedback on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. We're all on all, all the socials, of course. And uh, let us know what you want to hear more from. If you want uh, more about, if you want to hear more from these guys, uh, we all oh, definitely want to bring that to you. And we were sure in the next few months, that's going to be something that's going to be uh, a repeating topic in our world is how do we now navigate through all of this information. So thanks to Chris and Justin for being there with us today and for, uh, for them and for Wes, I'm John, and this has been another great episode of The Dental Guys. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbrand with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. So you've decided to buy your first practice or maybe another. Man, that's awesome. Now is the time though to begin planning the specific details of your new practice. No doubt, you can see the dream in your head, the look, the feel, and most importantly, the patient's lives you're gonna impact. Start committing these thoughts, these dreams to writing. Ultimately, your goal is to draft a comprehensive business plan. Doing so will help you obtain financing and it will even increase the market value of your future practice. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information.